what we look at it, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be in business. It's not, you know, just because you start a business doesn't mean you deserve to stay in business. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is all about creativity and hustle happening in and around the great state of Montana. Thanks for tuning in. Today's interview is a really fun one. I sat down with Bjorn Nabosny, the co-founder of Big Sky Brewing. And I say co-founder, you know, we get right into it. He's not too keen on titles. He's just a guy that works at a brewery and... The story of Big Sky is stuff of legend, at least in my world at the College of Business here. I mean, they came out of the business plan competition and just have had tremendous success with a, you know, their their notable product, Moose Drool, is just an iconic brand, particularly in the Northwest, but also I think they're distributed into 23 states now. And, you know, just really a, a Missoula company that is on the forefront of the craft brew industry. And it's fun to, fun to, um, just sort of observed their success. Anyway, talking with Bjorn was super fun. We got into a couple of interesting issues. One, their approach to growth and how they make decisions, uh, what may, what constitutes a go decision and what constitutes a no-go decision, and then how that aligns with their, their kind of brand parameters. We also talked a lot about um, their philosophy of giving back to the community they're an interesting company because they're tremendously embedded in the local scene here in Missoula, yet they're a company that kind of competes on a nationwide level. So um, the give and take between those two um, forces is, is kind of interesting. And then finally, in the closing minutes of the interview, I was able to, to sort of get Bjorn to talk about the issue of drinking on college campuses and the role that um, the role and responsibility that breweries have in that space and and you know, how they can do better, how, um, how policymakers can do better. So it was a really interesting interview. We, we, we got on a bunch of topics and I really thank Bjorn for his generosity of, of time, but also his generosity of thought in the sense that he was willing to talk about a wide ranging, um, array of issues. All right. I'll turn you over to Bjorn Nabosny. Bjorn, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. So you are, you don't like titles, you're a guy that works at Big Sky Brewing. Yeah, a guy that works at Big Sky Brewing. One of the co-founders, we have to put that in there. Yeah, yeah. Listeners probably already know that. Yeah, so we've been chatting a little bit. Your, you know, like I said before, your origin story for this this enterprise is the stuff of legend at the University of Montana and the College of Business. And that story's been told well. Yeah. Uh, you can look it up on the, the Big Sky Brewing website. Um, but what we want to talk about today is sort of what's next. I mean, you're at this... Uh, the brewery has arrived in many ways. It's been established for a long time, but now you are what twenty six states distributing in. We're actually um, we're our distribution rate area is actually twenty three states. Twenty three states. Yeah, um, we've actually we decided it was a long process, but we decided to pull out of Texas uh, at the end of last year because and and because it just wasn't profitable for us to sell beer there. The competition. There's so many breweries down there. I'd like to say the competition is, it isn't the reason why we pulled up, but that's always the reason why you leave someplace. Okay. If you can't compete, don't. Do you um, mean when you say competition, you just mean it's so dense or that others are making a better margin and you can't compete at price point? Price or? point, um, freight from Montana to mm. Texas is enormous. And okay. so we couldn't figure out a way to make um, a reasonable margin on, on anything that we sold in Texas because of, because of the freight component. Um, we were subsidizing it so heavily to be positioned on properly on the shelf price wise that that it, at the end where there was there was nothing left. We were actually losing money on on after we really put a pencil to it on yeah. every case we sold. But that's going to take a lot of kind of poise in an organization to 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 make the conscious decision that pulling back is the right choice for the business. I mean, a lot of businesses get to that point where they're forced to do that. Yes. seems like that wasn't the case here, but you made no. a, a strategic decision that pulling back from this particular market is, is the sound choice. It was, it was, yeah, it was a tough decision. I think because your ego comes into play again yeah. on that. And it's like, how can we do this? You know, and, and it comes into volumetrics, you know, we'd have to exponentially increase our sales to Texas and, and, and the spending that would that would we would have had to, you know, it's, it's the cart of the horse type thing. How do we 
how do we want to present ourselves in a market to, to grow the market? It, you know, it takes boots on the street, you know, which are very expensive. And Texas is, well, like Montana, a huge state. Right, and, big geography. And, and with lots of people, unlike Montana. So it was attractive when you look at, at population but then it becomes less attractive when you look at geography on that mm-hmm. and the number of people that it would take to support to do the an appropriate amount of sales to get your your freight in align in alignment with 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 an allowable price point but then you lose it all to labor on the other side so so yeah. it's one of those wrestling things that we we just couldn't f- make it work we left texas um with you know I, th- I thought our departure was great in that our network was very disappointed when we left. They're okay. like, we want you to stay. Huh. And we're like, but it doesn't make sense. And then we're like, okay, we understand. But if you come back, we would love, we had to take your brand back. Uh-huh. For- so the bridge is not burned? No, not at all. No. To make it work in a, in a market like that, at that distance, I mean, would you have to look at... So bottling or, or, or producing down on location and expanding in that way or contracting with a partner? I What's think that's that an like? option, but but the, the inherent problem with that, it, it, it changes the authenticity of your brand. Right. Okay. You know, it changes the story of we're we're a Montana brewery and and I think what we represent is, as as a Montana brewery is we have great clean water, you know, the big sky. You know, we mm-hmm. we named Big Sky Brewing, Big Sky Brewing it had nothing to do with selling beer inside the state. There's Big Sky everything, you know, yeah. in, in yeah. Montana already. So so there wasn't anything unique about that. What it what it is, is it's a great descriptor about who we are when and you hear it from folks when they come to Montana, it's like, yeah, the sky is bigger. <laughs> and and I don't know why, but it, it seems bigger when when you're here. And so part of it, I think an, an essential part of our brand and a brand is that often, you know, the authenticity, authenticity and an honest message. Wow. We are a Montana beer. This is how we live, where we live, where it's produced. Sure. And so I, th- I think that's that it, at least, you know, maybe that'll change in the future. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can't, um, but, but for now it really doesn't make sense for us to make beer anywhere else. Yeah, and we're seeing that authenticity in the craft brew space is such a such a needed brand attribute. Yes, and and when you look at authenticity now as craft, it's gotten pretty gray. It's yeah. it, it's hard to tell who is who is craft, who is a multinational mega corporation owned um, you know brewery, and and the the thing that what. I think the underlying thing about craft and myself, it, the most important thing is that there's quality. There's consistent. It's a consistent quality beer that that I can enjoy. I'm, I don't. I used to gravitate towards style. Now my what when I'm drinking a beer, um, regardless regardless of whose beer it is, I'm looking for quality. I want a quality experience regardless of where the beer is made. And um, but I think when we look at it right now, who makes it is, is becoming more and more important. Mm-hmm. When we look at a number of our competitors um, that we're competing, you know, that com- we're competing directly with, there's our indirect and our direct competitors, and our and a number of our direct competitors are now now wholly owned by either Anheuser Busch, which would be ABI, right, um, right. Miller Coors, or a, or a holding company. So um, uh, the dollars change. The landscape, I think, with regards to effectively competing against these folks, it's very hard to compete against the multinational, as it turns out. As, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah, you guys are doing it. Yes, we're, yeah, we're doing it. We're, we're just trying to stay edgy and be ourselves. And, and when people are going left, we try to go right, you know? So it's, uh, so we, we kind of march to a, the beat of a different drum. Right. And so you've said that before, like when you guys are expanding into new markets, you're competing against companies that are a lot bigger than Big Sky. Yeah, you have Moose Drool and a few others that are these iconic brands, particularly in the Northwest, that people sort of assume you're bigger than you are. Yes. Yeah. And which is which is nice going into into a new market because yeah, yeah. because it, you carry with that you carry some cloud. Right. And so we get there and we're already known. So we, we're not having to build the brand recognition necessarily when we when we enter a new market, which is wonderful. Um, you know, when, in having a brand like Moose Rule, you know, it's silly, it's 
iconic, it's whatever, but it's when you go in, the cost of entering a market for as, as close as I can equate it to is about 10 times, it costs 10 times more to garner new customers as it does to maintain wow. you know, yeah. our, our current customer base. So, so it gets less expensive the closer we get to home to maintain our, to maintain our, our market presence. And, and jumping in new markets is very scary because all of a sudden you're allocating dollars that you, on, a, on a guess and a hope that you're, that you're going to compete successfully there. Texas, it didn't work, um, but we had the the, the fortitude to, to make the right decision and, and and say, yeah, this isn't working for us. What does that process of entering a new market look like? I mean, are you buying into distributing? Are you like, what's the what's that process? Look well, like? for us, you know, in in the alcohol industry, we're, we're um, we have the three tier system. So we have uh, the the separation of manu- in three manufacturing distribution in retail um that was uh, uh as a result of, pro- of the end of prohibition we, we split the um the feds decided that that the best course of action was to split it all up so there couldn't be a potential monop- monopoly in any in any market that's gotten a little bit gray again uh, you know i in the alcohol industry we work in the gray a lot so I'll, you'll hear me say gray <laughs> quite a sure. bit Nothing um, wrong with gray. but uh but now what you see is a lot of crossover breweries are are Selling beer in their at the, at the on their premise, mm-hmm. brews will self distribute, and um, so we've got we've got facets of production, retail sale and wholesale sale that are that are coming on, under the umbrella of of, indi- of individual breweries, and so it it when we look at how we you know say go into a market and we, we look at those 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 facets of it is as we jump into say Minneapolis, I mean we've been selling beer in Minneapolis forever. But what, what you look at there is this, the, the regulatory environment is one of the first things that we look at sure. when, when we look at a market. Also, um, taking big data now, big data didn't exist when we, when we first started this thing, but where are people coming from? Who's visiting Montana? And so we're taking kind of rifle shot approaches. We look at, we look at demographics, um, we look at our visitors, and then we go, all right, but let's give it a go there. Okay. And, and okay. so we take a rifle shot approach to our market. And so take- interesting, looking at tourism data to get hypotheses about, okay, you know, if, if in one year or in a period of years, a lot of people from who knows where, yeah. Alabama, Al- yeah. are coming to Montana, Missoula, Glacier, whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe that's a reason to go into Alabama. And because what we'll do is, uh, and, and, I, and, and the, the kind of the thought behind that is when, when you – uh, kind of correlate your data to their market visits. What we want to do is give them a piece of Montana when they get home, and so they can yeah. remember when we were in Glacier, sure, or down in Yellowstone, and then they find our beer. Okay. They had our beer, and then they bring they want to bring it home or, or get a winner there. Yeah, and that highlights the the importance of that authenticity we yes. just spoke about. Yes, so it all kind of um, it, it's really funny because it all comes it all seems to keep keep coming back in full circles from. How we produce the, the the beer to how we sell the beer to where we market the beer keeps it just keeps coming in and in, in a full circle and it's and we have to be genuine at every step of the way. Yeah, and so looking at Missoula right now, I mean, what fifteen breweries yeah, in we'll, town? We'll have fifteen, and although nationwide, there's it's maybe an inflection point in the industry where craft is under some pressure. Yeah. Within, within different areas. And, you know, when we look at Montana, uh, by midsummer, I'm anticipating 90 in, in Montana, well, 15 in Missoula, but let's jump over to, I was just in California. There's 900 breweries in California wow. yeah. and, um, there'll be over a thousand here and in, in pretty short order. What's happened is, uh, not just with craft beer, but but there's been the local movement of people wanting locally produced produce, locally you know mm-hmm. locally produced beef beer, and and what and which is cool. I think it's I think it's really fun because I I love going to breweries, and so it doesn't hurt my feelings a lot that there there are 15 breweries and about to be 15 breweries in Missoula, um, but on the from the consumer standpoint, it's awesome. Sure. From the business standpoint, what it does is it, it just it's it can be the potential to have death by a thousand paper cuts, mm-hmm. and um, typically, and in the average in the United States right now is 
is uh, for a, a brewery, we'll sell roughly 700 barrels of beer on premise, um, on their own premise per brewery. That's 1,400 kegs. So 1,400 kegs are coming out of distribution. So that's coming out of, um, and the pie is finite. And so we're not looking at an infinite market here. We're looking at slicing the pie up in thinner slices. And and that comes at the expense of bars, which mm-hmm. are our customers, mm-hmm. um, restaurants, and other folks. So, sure. So that the slicing is where the, the paper cuts happen because what you, what you end up doing in, in the bars and, and other and, and taverns will feel this. They're feeling the crunch on that other side as there's a pr- proliferation of breweries. So it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. On one side, it's neat from a consumptive standpoint. You can see the, the dynamic of the, of the, of the market. Uh, the free market is saying, this is what we want. Um, but being in such a heavily regulated industry, the reaction side is, you know, the governmental side of, of the market is really slowing it down. Um, and it doesn't allow for the bars and the taverns to adapt as quickly as I think they, they could otherwise. Right. So I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Are there, are there key regulations that are in the way? Right oh, absolutely. Now? Absolutely. And they're the ones that you know, in, in our industry you don't want to talk about. You know, it's okay. like, because it's, you know, one thing, it gets scary. Nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, one of the, 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 the quotas in Montana, we have a quota system on, on liquor licenses and alcohol licenses in the state of Montana. So we have this artificial market that's been created in, you know, in Missoula, for instance, there, uh, a license is, is, uh, if you, if I want a full service liquor license with gaming, now there's gaming and no gaming. Gambling is a big right pivot on that too. Um, if you're going to pay three quarters of a million dollars for a license, just for the license, just for the license. Yeah. And so... And at its peak, it was over, you know, one had peaked out a couple of years ago. And that's on the secondary market. That's not that lottery system. That's on the secondary market. Right, so, right. yeah. And so we have this, this artificially high market, which, which a lot of folks, unfortunately, have, have banked their, their retirement. They've banked their, their livelihood on, a, on, this, on, asset. on, this, on this asset that, that really shouldn't exist mm. in, in, a, in, a, in a free market sense. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's so restrictive. But it's also keeping out... Um, a, a number of great restaurants that, that could um, sure. restaurants or bars or yeah, taverns yeah. that that could exist in because the the lack of of them, you know, the state has de- decided a number of years ago that it had it got to decide how many licenses an uh, individual market could bear uh-huh. as opposed to letting the market do it. I'm a free market guy. Too, no, so and then of. and then now they've created this artificial <laughs> bubble in a sense yes. that there's you know if they were to open it up. You know, they devalue all these these licenses that exist in the marketplace that people, like you said, have built their kind of portfolio around. Yeah. The the, the path to unwinding that out without without just dropping a bomb in the economy of the Oh, it'd state. be a disaster. It was, yeah. yeah. So now we're we're kinda of stuck in this Are you mode. Stuck? Yeah. But the breweries, there, there's no restriction on the number of breweries mm. in a market. Yeah. So what so what it is so what you see is is more breweries. The, pr- the proliferation of breweries because one of the, you know, if I wanted to, if I wanted to have an alcohol serving establishment, the easier path is actually starting a brewery right really? now. Yeah. Um, again, which I, which I think is neat and interesting, but you know, it's just a market. It's a, it's a, it's as a result of, of overregulation that we see the market always finds a way. It does. And so it's found this way that if I want to be in the industry, I'm going to get there. Yeah, to I mean, if you're entering this craft brew space, I mean, it's it's very product centric. You got to have yes. a good product, a good product. And yeah. so, if if, if your if your ambition is to be a restaurateur and you can't do that because of the regulations, so you decide I'm going to open up a brewery. Yeah, is that coming from a genuine place of craft? Well, I think a good cook is a good cook in a lot, in a lot of senses. <laughs> and so, you know, it's I think what you you know, and there's no restriction against food. You know, in in a brewery, yeah, so you can yeah. you can you can have that component, but I you know, but the alcohol component is is important for a lot of a lot of foods. Beer and wine pair very well with with foods, and if you can't have it, it really hampers your ability to be a an effective restaurateur or mm-hmm. or whatever on that on that side of on that side of the coin. And so, what we see in other states is is uh, I, I see a balancing where where the the licenses are less restrictive. I, you know, Washington State is a, is a great example. Yeah. I, I think you see the success on both sides because there's not this artificial market that, that, that's been created. Um, 
you know, I, we kind of got off on a tangent on this, but it, I mean, it's so important to our business at the, at the local level or the businesses or the businesses that we do business with because, sure. because it is a real sore spot. You know, there, we've got, um, what, roughly 2,700 bars in the state of Montana and, um, or, or licenses, I should say. Um, and there could be more, but maybe, There'd be less if the if the market were were, were freed up. Right. Who knows? We, we we can't we can't know that because I know that you know in a lot of places the value of somebody's retirement is they're holding out on that that license on the salability, but you still need a job until until you reach retirement. So maybe there'd be less bars. I know yeah. in some markets there would be, um, but it's really interesting um, that whole dynamic and how how really it affects. The psyche of Montana brewers, mm -hmm. Montana tavern owners, Montana, you know, just the alcohol industry in general in Montana. Sure. And so you guys, like we said, are in 23 states now. Mm -hmm. um, and this is your, your sole um, brewing facility. Yes. And so how close to capacity are you with this facility? Well, it, it depends on the time of year. Sure. Okay. And so, again, Montana, very, very uh, tourist driven. And so what we have is a double dip in 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 our sales cycle per year. So we have our shoulder seasons, the fall and the spring, which mm -hmm. end up being slow, slower. And so we have, we have plenty of excess capacity. We never have enough capacity in the summer. So we try to build our capacity on, on, op, on optimizing for basically a three month period. Okay. And so That's right now, to do. it's really tough to do. Yeah. Cause right now we have, okay, it's been, it's, we're coming into kind of the dip, you know, mm -hmm. um, well, we're in the dip right now because right after, after Christmas, you get, everybody has their new year's resolutions and whatnot and, and everybody's broke. And so our, our sales slow down. And then as we come in, as we, so we see a big dip through February and then we start coming out of it. It's, I shouldn't call it spring dip. It's more of a winter dip, but we, we start producing for summer and ramping up our production. Um, in the end of February, um, given our, our lead times on, on production. So we'll start ramping up and then we, we hit our peak. The peak beer selling period is actually July, but we actually hit our peak in the end of May because we're up if, upstream. So, writing orders. Yeah. So we're, yeah, yeah. so we're filling all the orders to, to hit the, hit the, hit the market. And, um, so yeah, so we peak out end of May, beginning of June. That's got to present some, or I would think some cash flow. It does. Interesting. It, it really is you're stocking up and ramping up production, labor, supplies. Yeah. And, and then, there's a delay. In yeah, the, in the whole, exactly. In, 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 in the process and or in, in, the, in the chain of things. So it's fascinating. You know, once you once you adapt to it, what, what we started doing, interestingly enough, um, we expanded into southern a southern tier of states to okay. try to offset. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Offset that. To offset seasonality the, the, function. Yeah, so we did offset that for a while, but as we grew, it came back because mm -hmm. um, because you still have the cyclical nature of, of the northern tier of states. We haven't escaped that because the the pull in the southern, you know, the, the snowbirds and whoever heads south, there's not a strong enough pull. They drink in December, January, sure. February, but it, the uptick isn't as great as I'd hoped. You know, for so that. are so, these are these things that you know, you sort of figure out as you go, or do you have hypotheses about these sorts of dynamics? It was a it? guess when we first okay. started doing it, but then following that, it's like we, uh, you realize quickly, oh yeah, yeah, our, our guess, we were right. Sure. And, um, and there's not a lot of information to look at the offset of a, of a Southern selling strategy in the winter versus Northern in the summer, because, um, you know, a lot of people, I think within the, the, because well, I think mainly because the, the strategy is one that's been relegated for the real large breweries, the multinationals and the huge huge folks. They're like, oh, I see this, right? Um, and and we and still we're, we're really too small to to really benefit immensely from it. But we do see it. We mm -hmm. do see that 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 little bit. And just that little bit just helps bring bring you through the winter. And right, so it just right. any any type of smoothing effect and anything that we can do to fill the tanks. That you know if we have. It, it it always just pains me if you have one tank just sitting empty. You're like, oh, it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yep. It's, but not not um, you're not at the stage where you know an, another facility or adding on to this is is on the menu. No, not right now. Yeah, no, and you've I, said before, like 
you're thoughtful about the growth trajectory you have for this for this enterprise. Yes. And so what does that look like? How do you sort of um, conceptualize what growth means to you, what it should mean to the business? What I look at business as is specifically ours. You know, we look at in pertaining to beer and alcohol. Um, it's one of the oldest known industries, mm -hmm. you know, uh, next to prost prostitution and politics, you know, there's alcohol and they all kind of intermingle. We don't know who's first. We'll figure that out at some point. I let think. the regulators decide. Yeah, let the, they can regulate. <laughs> yeah. And so we look at that and, and we're an old industry. We are thousands of years old. Sure. And, um, it seemed to me when I, when earlier in our stage, we were, we were in a rush to grow. It was like, grow, 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 grow. And as we've matured and as we've, we're very fiscal responsible with our company. Um, we're very good with money. Mm -hmm. And, um, and as we've established ourselves, okay, we, we established our, our brand, we established our company, we stabilized. When we look at what, what do we want? What, you know, what do we want as a company? Do we want to be the largest craft brewer in the United States? Is that our goal? No, that was, that was never a goal. Sure. And, and, and so, okay, so if that's not a goal, what is it? And, and we're like, okay, let's step back. And this has become more of a mosey for us. You know, it's kind of like, let's walk along, let's progress. Let's not stop, you know, doing interesting and fun things with our brand, but we can de-emphasize the need for double digit growth. And, 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 you know, and we've stated, you know, as kind of as a growth plan for the next, over the course of the next couple of years is, you know, if we, if we can grow at, at, at 3%, we're good. Yeah. We're golden. Yeah. And, and it's, it's sustainable. I would rather grow at, at zero to 3% growth per year over the course of 10 years than to have 20% growth for one year and all kinds then, of volatility. Yeah. The volatility. And then three, you know, for five straight years have two or 3% of decline. It's, it's not fun. And so what was the process like coming to that realization? I mean, I, I would think in the, in the early days, you're lean, you're hustling, you're just trying mm -hmm. to make, make this thing go. And then you have some success that's, that's pretty aggressive. And then, you know, you come to this point now where you have this maturity of your perspective I think where the where that happened for us was as a team sitting back and looking at again looking at who we are. What did what did you know? Ego is a very very powerful thing, and right? And and that's always comes to be part of the formula. Um, and we're like, where are we? You know, what does our ego you know say we need we need to be? Do we do we need to be huge? Mm. And I think that that helped us make. When we were like, no, we don't need to be the largest. We don't need to be these things um, that that a lot of what what American other American businesses are looking at um, as tech is looked yep. at rapid yep. growth. Everything everything slanted is growth. yeah, it's it's slanted towards this huge growth model, and we're like that doesn't fit us. What fits us is a profitability model, so, you know, sustainable growth, sustainable sustained prof profitability, and and taking out any of the the really you know relaxing the 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 i think the the ebb and flow of our of our day and day in day out business um was was which drove us to the decision like let's slow down sure let's be real with 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 who we are and let's look at this in in the long and take the long view right on, on our approach to selling and, and pretty much everything that we do at our company yeah so that clarity of of purpose and kind of poise in the way you operate I mean, it seems like you have a similar clarity with regard to your your commitment to this community. You yeah, know, Big Sky supports so many important causes, events, organizations. You're just such a, a an important presence in this community. What's what's been your kind of guiding philosophy about that? Well, and it, it kind of goes back to our origins again, again with the company. Um, what we look at it, you know, it, it's a privilege to be in business. It's not. You know, just because you start a business doesn't mean you deserve to, to stay in business. Right. Um, and we looked at early on as, you know, as having the privilege of doing of of, of doing business in Missoula, Montana. What you know, what does that mean to us? Um, we're like, well, it means that we're part of the community. And how are you a part of the community? Is well, you give back to the community. Sure. And you encourage growth and development of your community. That's again, one sustainable, but also. Um, but it's a great place to live. How can we influence as Missoula grows to keep this greatness of, about us, you know, within our, 
you know, when we look at our right now, we've been on the trail kick for the last couple of years of, of building trail for mountain biking uh-huh. and, and hiking and running. Um, and, and that's what, what the, what we saw, you know, is we, we identify a problem within the community and we try to change it. And, and we look at a community need and particularly for young people, um, uh, when we look at, we want to, I think the prevalence of computers and, and video games and all that stuff. I don't want to be one of those guys like, oh, video games, they, they, they're the, they're the evil that, that, that haunts us right now. Right. But, but <coughs> what you see is a, a lack of movement in youth and we, and, and we, and I think if, if, if you're not moving, if you're not active, uh, as kids and as adults, we, we can't stop moving ever, you know, because when you become sedentary, you just, it, it changes everything, you know, right. just, just blah, you know, and I was like, if, you know, if you don't move, you, at, at some point you can't move. I'm going on a kind of a diatribe. About that's this. okay. That's important kind stuff. Of, kind of the, the roundabout way about this is like, how do we do this? How do we, how do we help people move and not look like Camel Joe to the youth? Like we're selling beer to the youth. Hey, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you, you should, we're, we're, um, we, we built this skate park, so you should drink our beer. Mm-hmm. Well, what we ended up doing early on is we were like, w- with the different physical projects that we're working on, we're like, just don't put our name on it. We don't, we just, we, we don't just need to be attached yeah, to yeah, it in that way. Scenes. But what we can do is we could support it. And what we ended up, it had been 12, 13 years ago, um, where we decided a good avenue of supporting our community was through music. The music scene was pretty poor in Missoula. And, um, and we're like, wow, we could, we had this big backyard here. Sure. And we're like, we could throw a show and, and do it, do it as a fundraiser. Let's get a big band. And initially we thought we could get Pearl Jam to play in our backyard, big Pearl Jam fan. I'm so glad they're coming this summer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe um, we can get them this summer, but, uh, at a date, but um, Jeff Amet actually uh, through a friend, through a close friend, uh, Truxton Rolf, we kind of worked through, and and he gave us some guidance early on and helped us figure out how we do this. Sure. And we found out that that we couldn't do this ourselves, so we end up working with uh, uh, some different music promoters, and they were they were on board with our with our vision of. Uh, and we can't sell the beer. And so in our backyard. The, okay. So what we do is the idea was always it's going to be a nonprofit that's going to sell the beer and benefit from the – get the benefits of the beer sale. Cool. And then that supports a physical project. And what we always decided was 100% of the proceeds have to go to that physical project. We don't want to support administration. Mm-hmm. We don't want to support this thing. We want the thing built. Yeah, and you have and, some leverage to dictate those kind of terms. And so – which is nice. So over the, over the course of the last dozen years, we've – you know. Help build Brennan's Wave, uh, the Mobash Skate Park. Um, I ride for Tanner. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Multiple trail systems um, in and around Missoula. Uh, we've uh, with we've worked with the Ice Rink. Um, then the, uh, the the Children's Museum, Children's Historical Museum. We bought two buses, you know, through through music. With yeah. Them. So we've done a lot. So it's so that music components really become a very large philanthropic wing for us that that really we can go and go we can identify the need and go all right let's go after it and and we could have a great party in our backyard at the same time yeah and so along those lines you know the 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 philanthropic commitment seems largely based on wellness activity education children and so you know how does the, the the how do you and your partners kind of view your your responsibility in terms of wellness so what i'm thinking of is you know alcohol on college campuses and, and things like that yeah. i mean this is this is going to be a really salient issue for a company like yours yeah it's it's uh it's tricky when you yeah. especially when we look at at people that are well look and looking at our local campus um we got involved last year with the university of montana right the grizz lager the grizz lager yeah, and big success yeah it, it was it was it was a little bit tricky in that um, the emphasis, what we wanted to do with that, with that beer, as we were discussing it with the University of Montana, was to take a beer, um, and there was, you know, there's a little bit of backlash on it. Yeah. But the, but the intent of it was, okay, what we we sell our beer to people that are, are that that are of a legal drinking age. Mm-hmm. You know, sure, 
people underage to get that, but that's it's illegal. So sure. so we're looking specifically at the legal component of this, and we have youth that live on our campus. But they're not youth; they're young adults. They're you know mm-hmm. that that um, that that drink downtown, and so so we looked at this and like let's support the bus, you know, help pay for the bus to get people to and from campus safely on the weekends. Let's su- help support alcohol education and awareness on campus. And um, the third component of that was scholarships because, yeah. you know, the university has found itself in a position where, where funding is well, very tight. Yeah. And, and this was our way of going, all right, we have an opportunity to support the education side you know, not, not this was wasn't focused at, at athletics at all. So much of the focus of the University of Montana has been on, on athletics, mm-hmm. you know, and and we wanted our focus to be on the other side. Sure, and because well, the the vast majority of us that that are that either run or are part of Big Sky Brewing Company are university alumni, and so we wanted to also you know get back to to our alma, our alma mater, and so it was a, a way for us to get back. Yeah, it seems like the the right way to configure it too. I mean, the thought you put into it and the arrangement. And I think so, and unfortunately, we'd hoped that the we'd had hoped that the licensing was going to go longer. Uh huh. But um, there was some controversy on the athletic side yeah. with regards to um, uh, a sponsorship that they've got from a um, from Miller Coors. Sure. And um, so the university has, has decided to to end our licensing early, um, which is. And to me, it's kind of silly because what they, what they in essence have done is just we don't want your money. We don't we we are in a in a fiscal conundrum, but we don't want this pile of money. the The royalty that we that we that we paid um, was, oh boy, I, it put us in like the the I think number two wow. position for the University of Montana. There's, we're talking big dollars. Yeah, we're we're um, I think it had this gotten some time to develop and there's the really heavy cyclical nature of this but you know we're looking we're talking i don't know 60 to a hundred thousand dollars per year of royalty so sort of big money on that but but um but on the bright side it was a lot of fun mm-hmm. and i think um we helped we did we did some positive stuff with the university of montana and helping support some some underfunded programs right you know kind of going a little deeper into that i wonder about so i I listened to this podcast this morning and this 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 woman who had just written a book about sexual assault on campus had had a variety of guidelines for recommendations for policy changes and and Mm -hmm. one of the things she recommended was lower the drinking age to 18 years old and that was interesting and and at, at first i thought well okay let's explain this and her premise was that on campuses, you've got this arbitrary kind of 21-year-old cut point that, that cuts the population in two. Now, everybody on campus is, is, is drinking, but some of them it's illegal. And it kind yes. of, for those that for whom it's illegal, it kind of glorifies the nature of, of getting your hands on alcohol. Yeah, and so, getting away with it. Yeah, I mean, I know that's a little far afield of, of Big Sky, but you have thoughts on that? Like policy interventions to maybe create it's, a healthier relationship with alcohol in our society? It's tricky. I think, um, and I don't like to compare us to the uh, United States Europe because we're not Europe. Mm-hmm. We're, we're our, we are our own thing. Um, and But I think we've been rather irresponsible for a hundred years on, on our perception of alcohol. And, and, and there's, and again, there needs to be some separation there too, because I think, um, when we look at beer, uh, I think Colorado has had a really good plan for years at, at the three, two, you know, and then the, then the graduation sure. into the higher alcohol, uh, you know, beverages. And I think it makes sense to some extent because all of a sudden you're 21. So you can go gangbusters. Yeah. Right? yeah go right down and get your clear. Yeah. And so I think, um, it's pretty tricky, but we need to put what's the the interest of the young people ahead of what what we think, you know. To, I guess either our our, I mean, this gets really deep because it, and it, they say never talk about politics and religion, and this <laughs> involves both of those. And so I'm trying to word this without this being, is the perfect venue. Yeah, because because <laughs> because those things that you just that it's 
it's, I think we, a lot of the stuff would be still unavoidable if we had a graduated process of, of, of bringing people in to, you know, if they choose to drink, you don't have to drink, you know, that's not, right, you know, right. it, it, but it seems like societally we've said you're, uh, unless you drink as a, as a young person, quite often you're, you're not part of this cool kids club getting away with something, yeah. whatever. And if I do it, I'm going to binge drink. And because I I can't get this regularly, so I'm just gonna sure you know uh, go hog wild on Saturday night um, with whoever I bought the booze from. We used to get it from bums, you know, give them offer a couple bucks and, <laughs> and get a commission, <laughs> <laughs> give them a beer, whatever. But but it's but I think that it seems like we've, we we I I have to agree with her because I think we've created an environment where where people are binge drinking and been there's the end result of binge drinking is usually not, not, it's not healthy. No, bad you stuff know. happens. Yeah. And so if somebody gets overly intoxicated and loses control, does stuff that they wouldn't normally do. Right. When if they had, they had um, more temperance uh, attached to it. That's tricky though. That's a tricky, tricky subject without looking like an asshole. Um, so oops, I'm sorry, but, uh, no, no, no. This but, is yeah. You can say whatever be, you want because I just, I just really think that we need to mature in our approach to this. It's just, I, yeah. I mean, like most things in our society, the, the truth is in the nuance. You yeah. got to be thoughtful, and when people sort of just dig in on their various positions, I don't think you get much productive, creative, no. dis, you know, problem solving. We need to have a real healthy, open conversation about about alcohol and how we treat alcohol in the United States. And, and change the, you know, I think the perception of, of, you know, one, one of the fortunate things that we see that youth is not drinking as much as it did when, say, I was a kid. Mm -hmm. There's a decline in, um, in, in drinking, underage drinking. But also what's coming with that is there's also a decline in, in, in young folks not having driver's licenses. Not, yeah. and it was interesting. I read this article about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's talking about what youth aren't doing now. Mm -hmm. What they're not doing is they're not they're not dating. Uh, underage, you know, sex is is on on the decline for for youth. Drinking is on the decline. Smoking is on the decline. And and waiting for for the way to wait for driver's licenses. Huh. All that stuff I wanted when I was a kid. Yeah. And now it's like it's like what the heck? Want to go chase girls and and get as much beer on? You know, yeah. If they're not going after those things, what are they going after? Um, well, the, the difference has been apparently what the argument of the article was social media has changed that dynamic Okay. because they're interacting with each other on their computers and their, their phones rather than, than face to face. Sure. So what they say is, is people, they become more solitary in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was a kid, we, we would, the, we'd have gathering spots, you know, yeah. we'd go cruise, do whatever, you know, and, um, and that's not something that happens any longer. Um, so, um, it's, which is kind of a scary thing on one hand too, because, um, we're a social being, you know, we're social beasts and isolating our youth, I think, and, and the exposure to the overexposure to social media, I think is unhealthy. Um, and, in the, in the bigger spectrum, cause they're not communicating as real people. You know, facial expressions are important. A yeah. flexion in your yeah. tone is so important, and they're missing that. On the plus side, they're apparently they're writing more now than ever. You know, and um, because because of texting and and right, different set of communication yeah. tools and norms emerge. Well, that's one thing we've talked about. You know, on this podcast before is the you know sort of the magic that happens at a university is is a lot of it is in that face to face direct communication. Um, yes. you know online approximation of that can have other benefits that maybe we haven't even recognized yet, yeah. but it's definitely those statistics you cited say something about what our society's where it's going. I'm not sure. I don't know if it's you know, good or bad. Yeah. Or we what, don't know yet. We don't know. Yeah. We're in the middle it of it. It kind of is right. I mean, yeah. you, can't, you can't really unwind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think, you know, the thing I love and particularly when I look at my university experience, was the immersion of, I, I love the dorm experience. Sure. I thought that was good because all of a sudden you have within your group of friends, when you're at, a, at a, as a youth, you kind of have the same viewpoint, you, have, you know, and all of a sudden you have this, this con, all these different opinions and ideas about stuff. And that was pretty awesome. Yeah. It was, it was really um, from a guy that came from a small town in Northwest 
Montana. It was it was shocking and awesome at the same time. Sure. Um, and I think that's every bit as important as any of the classes I took. Absolutely. It's opening up your mind to all that stuff. Yeah. Well, Bjorn, you've been uh, hugely generous with your time and insights. I know we pulled you a little bit off the standard script here. And I oh. appreciate you going into those issues. Yeah. Um, but more so, I appreciate just your your commitment to this community and the university and just the thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness with which you bring to your, to your daily operation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think, you know, from our, from our team's perspective, it's been, a, it's been, like I said, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be in business and, and to run a successful business. So it's, it's been an honor to, to, to continue to be a, a force within the community. And I, I, I would argue that we're just getting started. You know, we've got a lot, a long ways to go watching the coming years of, of stuff that we're, we hope to do to be impactful in a positive way. Well, nice. Hopefully this podcast can survive a few more years and we'll have you back on to uh, talk about what's happened. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. All right. Hope you enjoyed that chat with Bjorn. I certainly did. And uh, coming up next week... We have one that, uh, this one is pretty fun. I got to sit down with Rob Angel. Rob Angel is the creator of Pictionary. And it was a total random sequence of events that led me uh, to the opportunity to talk to Rob. And that's kind of a key part of the interview. And it's super fun. Uh, The connection is that his children are uh, students here. His, His daughter just graduated from the University of Montana last spring. And then his son is enrolled as a student at the, at the code school. And I think he actually probably has just graduated. So that's the connection with Rob. What an interesting guy, ton of energy. And the interview is super fun. So look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. Remember that A New Angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in Missoula, and they have a keen interest in the University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out www.cedcareers.com. Moving forward, if you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things with creativity and hustle, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. First, rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the show. Second, write a review. The more reviews we get, and hopefully positive ones, the more we can grow. And third, please just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship opportunities, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash a new angle. There you will also find a link to support the pod. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few people for making this project happen. First of all, Elizabeth Willey, Communications Director here at the University of Montana College of Business. I'd also like to thank recent UM graduate Michelle DeFluke and our fabulous interns Savannah Sletton and Max Gibson. And a special thanks to VTO for providing the show with music. Finally, thanks to my producer, Stefan Borson. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time. Oh.